Hi, in this video I will be trying to repair the ZX81 computer. First I am going to do some measurements to the board, then build a circuit to test the Z80 processor, read out the ROM and try to make a SRAM tester. Will it eventually lead to a fixed ZX81? Stay tuned to find out. This is the Sinclair ZX81 computer. I got it on eBay from the UK. It came in a box which had some small damage. The description said that it was complete, but not that it was working. The case of the ZX81 computer is in a good condition, with no visible dents or scratches. It includes this basic programming guide and a Sinclair ZX81 software catalog with an order form. I guess it's a bit too late to put it in the mail. The RF cable that connects to the TV is also included, as is the power supply, which is in bits and pieces. I guess that my first task will be to fix it and change the UK to an EU plug. Luckily, there is also this original jack connector included. Let's start with the power supply and see if the ZX81 will give any signs of life. Someone has cut off the lead and connected a barrel jack. I wonder why. Fortunately, there is a matching mail plug that fits. I will not put too much effort in completely rebuilding the cable and will try to attach the power connector to the existing leads. By the way, the power supply is 9V DC and 700 milliamperes. The first task is swapping the UK power connector to an EU version. UK plugs have a built-in fuse, which is not needed in the EU. The reason for it is that the sockets in the UK are connected sequentially and each connection needs its own fuse. Instead of putting the fuses in the sockets, they were included in the plugs themselves. Initially, I wanted to install this power plug, but RetroWizard gave me a tip on Twitter about the slim looking power connectors. They don't have an earth connection, but it is not needed as there is no earth wire that goes to the adapter anyway. The included lead was also not perfect, as it had some bare wire visible on it. Luckily, I spotted this before turning the power adapter on, as it would probably ruin it. I will cut off this damaged part of the wire. The remaining part should be long enough. Let's check if the remaining piece of the lead does not have any other shorts. And it looks fine. Checking the jack connector did not reveal any issues with it as well. Let's also test if the power supply is actually working. 13.85 volts without any load sounds fine. After connecting the ZX81 to it, the voltage should drop to 9 volts. Final step is to attach the jack connector. For now, I will do this temporary solution and isolate it using electrical tape, as I am curious if the computer will actually work at all. Final checks before powering it on also look fine. Moment of truth, let's connect the power supply to the ZX81 and also the RF cable. The manual states that your TV needs to be tuned to UHF channel 36. So let's do that. And it gives something, but it is just a black screen. Maybe the RF signal is not coming through or maybe I am tuning it wrong. I also have this small TV which is a bit older and has manual tuning to UHF channels. Let's try using that. But still no luck, nothing is showing up. So I have decided to do the composite mod, just to be absolutely sure. Time to open up the ZX81. There are 1, 2, 3, 4 screws, 2 are hidden under these rubber pads. No, still not opening. Wait, there is another one hidden under this part as well. And now the bottom does come off. 
nice. There is another screw holding to the front of the case and I have to be careful here while disconnecting the keyboard. The composite mod requires one 2 and 3904 transistor and two low value resistors. I have used 122 ohms. Let's slowly open up the casing of the RF modulator. And now we will need to cut some wires. First is this wire that provides 5 volts. We can see that here. And the one next to it, which is the video signal. Then bend the legs of the transistor in this way and shorten the base lid by just a bit. Apply a touch of solder to the 5 volt connection. Mine is a fragment short here, but it is long enough. Then thin the collector of the transistor so it will be easier to solder. Just a touch with the soldering ion should be enough to make a firm connection. The base of the transistor connects to the video signal. The next step is to trim the wires of the resistors. Then put a bit of solder on the corner of the modulator casing. And attach the shorter wire of the 100 ohms resistor to it. Solder the emitter of the transistor to the other end of the resistor. And finally, solder the other 22 ohms resistor to the center pin of the RCA connector and to the emitter of the transistor. I had to bend the leads a little bit, but it worked out fine. Ok, time to connect the composite cable to the RCA connector and see if we can get an image on the screen. But there is no change. I guess it is time to debug the board in a greater detail. Let's check if all the ICs are getting power. First is the Z80 chip. It looks fine. The ULA, ROM and memory chips are also getting the correct voltage. Let's check if the crystal is generating a clock signal. And we are getting a nice sine wave with a frequency of 6.5 MHz. This clock signal is going to pin 35 of the ULA chip. It looks kind of cricket for a clock signal, but let's say that it is acceptable. The ULA clock out is on pin 14 and it should be divided by half. It doesn't look very promising, but this signal still passes through a clock circuit until it enters the Z80 clock input on pin 6. Somehow the frequency of this signal is 3.25 MHz, but it looks more like a heartbeat than a clock signal. So at this point I have a dark suspicion that the problem lies in the ULA chip. Unfortunately I don't have a spare to swap it, so I have decided to continue checking the other ICs and components. Let's take a look at the electrolytic capacitors. Connecting an ESR meter to the first 22 microfarad capacitor shows an open loop, which is definitely not ok. The second one with a value of 1 microfarad shows a value of around 1 ohm, which is fine, but I am still going to replace it. First I will replace this broken 22 microfarad capacitor with a new one. I don't have a 1 microfarad axial capacitor at the moment, so I will have to improvise by bending the legs of this radial one. Let's do a quick test. And unfortunately, that was not the fix. The inevitable is to desolder the Z80 and the ULA chip and place sockets for easy replacement. I wanted to know if the Z80 processor is working. I cannot simply swap it with another one because the computer is not functioning. Instead, I will build a breadboard circuit to test the Z80. I have used a test circuit that I found online on z80.info. The link is in the description. It requires just a couple of LEDs and resistors. As a clock, I will use this breadboard module that originates from Ben Eater's tutorial videos. Let's trigger the reset and it's not counting. At first, I thought that the processor was faulty. I have connected the scope to investigate the problem. As you can see, the levels of the clock pulse 
are lower than the CMOS levels and the CPU never gets triggered. But when we remove this green LED and turn the clock back on, we see that the levels get higher. After I reset the circuit, the LEDs start to blink as they should. I've posted a couple of pictures of my repair on Twitter. A fellow retro friend, Mitchell Dayton, has noticed some corrosion under the socket that I have already soldered, so I started inspecting it. Luckily, the traces and vias were still intact. I have cleaned the corrosion off using cotton swabs dipped with some IPA. It's time to desolder the ULA chip. As usual, I have applied extra solder to the pads, that way it will be easier to suck all the solder out using the desoldering gun. We are almost there. And success! This one went out without any hassle. Let's do a few final touch-ups and clean it off with some IPA. The 40 pin socket fits in seamlessly. Let's put some blue tags to hold the socket in place and solder all the pins. Again, some isopropyl alcohol to clean the flux remains and remove the blue tags. There is always some solder left on the pins of the desoldered chip and I like to smooth it out with the soldering iron. The ULA chip fits in perfectly. And the Z80 does as well. In the meanwhile, the Axial 1 microfarad capacitor has arrived and I can replace this ugly one that I have soldered in initially. To sum up, the Z80 processor is working, the ULA is still under investigation and the memory and ROM are still to be tested. Let's take out this basic ROM and see if it works. My Mini Pro programmer does not support this chip by default, so to read out the contents of this 2364 8KB ROM, I am going to build an adapter using these two sockets. The full wiring of this 2364 to 28C64 adapter can be found on a website that I have linked in the description of this video. First, we have to cut off some pins of the 24 pin socket. Next, we will need three short wires to bridge some connections between the sockets. The first wire connects to pin 28 of the 28 pin socket. The second wire will attach to pin 23 that is the address line A11. The third wire connects to pin 2 and it is A12. I will make some markings using a sharpie on pins 26, 23 and pin 20 and cut three thin strips of electrical tape. The tape will cover the pins in the socket so they won't touch and short the pins on the socket that is on top. Now it's time to solder the first wire to pin 24 of the shorter 24 pin socket. I have laid both sockets on the side and tried just to touch the connection with a piece of solder. Don't hold the soldering iron in one spot too long as it will melt the plastic that holds the pin. The third wire that we have soldered to pin number 2, which is A12, connects to pin 21 of the smaller socket. And the second wire, which is A11, connects to pin 18. Cut off the wires that stick out. And connect both sockets to each other. The end result should look like this. It is a good idea to test if we don't have any shorts, especially on the pins that were connected with electrical insulation tape. The ROM chip can now be placed inside the 24 pin socket. It's easy to look past that but pin number 1 of the chip is always marked with a dot. Insert the chip into the Mini Pro programmer and start up the programming utility. The IC I have selected is the AMD AM28C64A with DIP28. Now press the read ROM icon to read out the contents of the ROM chip. It looks like the chip is read out completely, but are the contents correct? To check, we will export the data to a binary file. 
I have found the original ZX81 ROM somewhere online and downloaded a hex edit compare tool. Now when I select compare files, it will let me select both files. And it looks like they are both the same, as the tool cannot find any differences. Another way to compare two files on Linux or Mac is to use the diff command. You just specify both file names as arguments and when there is no output, the files are identical. We can now conclude that the ROM chip is not broken and can be placed back into the ZX81. Next chip on the testing line is this 1KB static RAM chip. I am going to try to build a tester using the Raspberry Pi Pico microcontroller. The Pi Pico inputs take 3.3 volts and are 5 volts intolerant, so I will use bidirectional level shifters to convert the 5 volts of the RAM chip. The ones that I am using are based on the TXS0108E chip. Finally, I ended up with a circuit that looks like this. Then I have written some Python code that writes and reads a test pattern to the SRAM chip. But after executing the code, writing to the chip looked fine. However, reading back the test pattern showed some strange quirks. It always read back the same pattern. Initially, I thought that the chip was fried, but the pattern seems strange. I have puzzled about this for quite a while, and somehow removing the SRAM chip yielded the same result. Looks like the level shifter is buffering the data in some way. I might go back to this puzzle or just create an SRAM tester with an Arduino which is 5 volts compatible and does not need voltage conversions. Let me know in the comments if you would like me to make another video on the subject. For now, I have assumed that the RAM chip was fine. And luckily, in the meanwhile, another ZX81 got delivered, which was supposed to be working. I opened it up and it looked in an excellent order. So that was a good sign. I have connected the power adapter and the RF cable and the famous cursor showed up. Now I could finally swap the ULA chip to the other computer, so I proceeded with the desoldering of the ULA chip. That went faster than I thought. And while at it, I also soldered a socket. The ULA chip could finally be swapped. I am connecting a composite cable here, as I have previously modded this modulator. And a cursor shows up. So in the end, it was the ULA chip that was broken. The brightness of the video is a bit dark, so I cranked up the brightness on the television set. I will probably need to change one of the resistors to a smaller value, or maybe replace the whole modulator altogether with the one that supports the back porch for a better image. Let's do a final check and connect the keyboard. I will press all the keys to test them. And it looks like they are all working. And for the final touch, I will add some heat sinks to the ULA chip. However, I have heard some say that it is useless to do so. Time to put the ZX81 back together. The pads did not have any glue left on them, so I have attached them to a double-sided tape. And cut them out so they can easily be reapplied. Famous last words, it is done. The other ZX81 still had an unmodded modulator, so I connected it to this small black and white TV. Now I can finally have a bit of fun and program some basic. Thank you for watching and sticking to the end. I hope you have found this video useful. If so, then please give it a thumbs up and consider subscribing to my channel, as I am going to create more videos like this in the future. In the description below I have provided links to pages that were discussed in this video. Thank you so much for watching and bye bye.